How do you catch a rocket? Sounds like a big question, and it is, but the answer is somehow even bigger. Mechazilla, a giant steel tower on a beach in the middle of nowhere, Texas, with robot chopstick arms that can pluck the world's most powerful rocket booster out of thin air. And for every bit as revolutionary as this towering beast might be, it's probably not as complicated as you might think. So let's figure out how this thing works. Now, maybe the first question that we need to answer is more like, why would you catch a rocket in the first place? We know that SpaceX can land a rocket, they are already famous for that. So they definitely could have just put landing legs on Starship and called it a day, and yet the company has made a big decision to try something entirely new. This all comes down to something called first principles thinking. It's a reasoning method that has guided the development of the entire Starship program at SpaceX. What we do is identify the problem that we are trying to solve in its most basic sense. And then we strip away any preconceived notions or analogies to existing solutions. Pretend like no one else has ever landed a flying machine before. Then we find a new solution that is designed specifically for our problem. So when it comes to landing a rocket, we have to think, how can we simplify this process? What parts can we remove? So the first breakthrough that SpaceX engineers made was this new idea that the rocket doesn't actually need landing gear. If you think about the function of our rocket booster in the most basic sense, it lifts off, flies to space, deploys a payload, comes back down again, and then lands. So if we put landing gear on our rocket, then we've added on a system that needs to be carried along for the entire mission, but is only used for the very last step in the process. So in a first principles approach, the only problem that we need to solve is how to get the rocket that last 100 feet from the air to the ground. Well, what if there was a giant robot arm at the landing zone that could just grab the rocket from the air and place it on the ground? That is a first principles solution, and the payoff is that now, instead of building a new set of landing gear for every single rocket, thereby making each rocket more complicated and expensive to manufacture, and adding another part that's likely to wear down and need maintenance, instead of all that, we build one landing robot. And because this landing gear doesn't need to go all the way to space and back, we build it strong and durable so that it can catch rockets over and over and over again without ever needing to be replaced. And while we're at it, we've got a launch tower, right? Why not also make it a landing tower? And as an added bonus, we can use the same mechanism that catches the rocket and lowers it on the ground to also pick the rocket up and put it on the launch stand. That just eliminated the need for a crane at the launch site. First principles. In August 2021, Elon Musk wrote, SpaceX will try to catch the largest ever flying object with robot chopsticks. And he accompanied that with this clip from The Karate Kid, where Mr. Miyagi explains, Man who catch fly with chopstick accomplish anything. Now, we'll have to assume that the same goes for rockets. The first thing that SpaceX had to do was build the Godzilla of launch towers. It's a 145 meter tall steel frame that's built on four thick vertical rails tied together with a triangular shaped network of steel beams. Most launch towers are just there to hold the rocket steady. At best, they stop it from tipping over. This one actually has to lift and carry the weight of the biggest rocket ever made. Now we have to mechanize it. The primary lifting muscle for the launch tower comes from an unlikely source. You see, there was a time many years ago before First Principles took hold, when SpaceX had a totally different idea about how they were going to launch and land the Starship. They would do it at sea. And the company was so committed to this ocean launch pad idea that they purchased two deep sea oil rigs. SpaceX named the drilling platforms after the moons of Mars. Phobos and Deimos, and they began the process of stripping them down for conversion into floating spaceports. That turned out to be a bad idea, and fair enough. If we go back to our mantra of simplification, taking a rocket that you build on land, floating it out to sea, launching it to space, landing on the water, and then shipping it back to dry land again, 
that's not efficiency, it's madness. But who among us hasn't chased a bad idea way too far? Anyway, whatever SpaceX lost in the whole oil rig experiment, they also gained something incredibly valuable, the muscle for their Mechazilla. Getting back on track, the engineers probably realized that they didn't have to invent a new method for lifting a rocket up and down when they already had the answer right in front of them. The oil rigs used a system of winches and steel cables to lower and retract giant drills from the bottom of the ocean, so they just transplanted that into their launch tower. Mechazilla has four heavy-duty electric motors that are mounted at the base of the tower and combine to produce 6,000 horsepower. These pull on steel cables that run through a pulley system and connect with the chopsticks, just like Mr. Miyagi taught us. In this case, our chopsticks are 36 meter long tubular steel truss structures. They're built like bridges, incredibly strong. Each one is the length of three school buses. The chopstick arms ride up and down the rails of the tower, just like the cart of a roller coaster on a track. To open and close the arms, Mechazilla uses two large hydraulic pistons. They pull back to open and push out to close. That allows both chopsticks to move independently. Now, so far, this has all been relatively simple stuff, and it really helps to demonstrate that you don't actually have to be a super genius to do something revolutionary. You just need the guts to try something that no one else has ever done before. The only part of the Mechazilla that gets a bit complicated is right where the actual catching of the rocket takes place. We don't want to crush our starship like a fly, so we need a very delicate and precise action here when it all comes together. Along the inside edge of each chopstick is a catch rail. These are 20 meters long, and the top edge of the rail is just under half a meter wide. This is where the chopstick and the rocket make contact. If we flip over to our starship, the booster and the orbiter are both fitted with catch pins. On Super Heavy, they are right below the grid fins. On the ship stage, they're just under the nose flaps. These pins are about one third the width of the catch rail, and the two surfaces need to line up perfectly for this to happen. To achieve that alignment, the Mechazilla uses a very important yet underappreciated piece of technology, a radio receiver built into the very top of the tower. If we remember back to the sixth flight of the Starship, the booster was forced to abort a tower landing and ended up splashing down into the ocean, which seemed weird at the time because we could not see anything that had gone wrong until cameras zoomed in on the Mechazilla and noticed that an antenna right at the very top had been bent over during the launch. That's how the tower and booster communicate with each other. It's a critical part of the landing process. The booster knows its own exact location, and it's continuously transmitting that data to the Mechazilla so that it knows where to position the chopsticks for the catch. Then, as the booster starts to pass down through the open arms, there are radar sensors built into the catch rails that will start to pick up the exact distance between the arm and the side of the rocket. We can see this step in the moments before every booster catch. The chopsticks spring to life, often with each one moving independently to find the booster and prepare for the final clampdown. The first contact between the chopstick and the rocket is not graceful. The arms come in and bang against the side a few meters below the catch pins. It looks a little clumsy, but that's actually very important. These chopstick arms are incredibly heavy, weighing in around 100 metric tons, and they're moving pretty fast to clamp down on that rocket booster. So we have a force at play called inertia. Basically, an object in motion wants to stay in motion. So you can't just stop a 36 meter steel bridge on a dime, it wants to bounce back and forth. And if that bounce happens too close to the catch pin, then we've got a disaster. So the catch rail is designed to hit the booster. That's why the inner edge of the chopstick is lined with foam padding. The foam is then covered with a very thin sheet of metal to stop it getting burned away as the rocket engines pass by. And when that foam pad first hits the side of the rocket, it's going to dent in and deform to absorb the impact, then bounce back and hug the side of the booster as it comes down that final meter to make contact between the pin and the rail. Now we are in the final second of the catch. 
The booster engines are still running, so the full weight of the rocket is not on the chopsticks yet. The catch rails are supported by two hydraulic pistons in the middle where the pins contact. And then it has gas shock absorbers on both ends of the rail, just like the shocks in your car. So as the booster engines shut down, the rail will cradle that weight by dropping almost one meter, with the shocks and pistons gradually absorbing the momentum of the rocket and bringing it to a gentle stop. And there you go, we caught a rocket, and it didn't require any kind of new revolutionary invention. All that we really needed was a thoughtful approach and the courage to do something that everyone said was impossible. That's what SpaceX does. That's what they've always done, and that's why we can't wait to see what happens next.